friends, I hope you are doing well. Here we go with the second video on phonological processes and this second part will be reserved for the most famous naturally occurring phonological process which is assimilation. Before the contents of the video unfold, I would like to seize the opportunity to thank all of you for showing interest in the previous video on phonological processes. In the last video, we talked about the notion of phonological process and we illustrated it by means of the process of aspiration in English. Today, we are going to talk about assimilation. What is assimilation? Assimilation in phonology refers to the phonological process whereby a sound takes on the features of another sound. In other words, it's a situation where one sound looks more similar to its neighbor. This is, of course, regardless of the type of sound that we have. So much so that a consonant can take features from a consonant. A consonant can, can take features from a vowel. A vowel can take features from a consonant. And a vowel can take features from a vowel. As an illustration of assimilation processes whereby consonants take features of other consonants, we can simply refer to the uh, to what happens when we append the morpheme, the plural morpheme s, to some nouns. Okay, this is an oft quoted example. Whenever there is a discussion in uh, or, or on uh, the notion of phonological processes, so if we take a word like door and another word like book. Then, of course, we notice that in door, the last consonant, er, is voiced, while in book, the last consonant is voiceless. Now, what happens when we append the plural s, the s of the plural, the pronunciation of this s depends on the voicing features of these last consonants. For book, because k is voiceless, the s is also voiceless. So we have here a consonant taking the feature of a consonant. Compare this with door, where uh, the sound, uh, the last sound is voiced, which is r, and by virtue of it occurring immediately after the sound, the s takes on the voicing feature of r, uh, and it becomes also voiced, and the actual pronunciation is doors rather than doors, where vowels take the features of consonants or take some features from the neighboring consonants. A well-known example in this respect is the process known as nasalization. Nasalization is a process that affects vowels, okay, by having these vowels acquire the feature of nasality by virtue of juxtaposition by virtue of occurring in the vicinity of a nasal consonant. Now, when we pronounce a word like seem or seen, okay, or uh, mean, let's take mean, it's because there are more sonorants here, mean, uh, uh, um, hardly any of us would deny the idea that when we say mean, the E sound is nasalized for obvious reasons. The reason why this nasalization has taken place is that there is an anticipation of a nasal sound after, so the vowel acquires a nasal feature. But these are just uh, quick examples to illustrate these different scenarios that we have. There are, of course, situations where consonants take features from vowels. And here we can illustrate this by referring to dark L versus clear L. L being a lateral liquid, a voiced lateral liquid, can change its articulation depending on whether on the nature of the preceding vowel. If I have a word like feel, then the L here is not a dark L, it's a clear L. But compare this with the pronunciation of a L immediately after a back vowel, especially a low back vowel. When I have a word like call, I will call you. So here, the liquid L has acquired a coloring, a pharyngeal coloring, quote unquote, a back coloring by virtue of its occurrence after a back and a low 
vowel. In some languages, like French, the L, you know, has gone to an extreme degree, to an extreme level. How? We do not have a situation, as, as is the case in English, where the L assumes two pronunciations. But actually, what happens in French is that the L has disappeared altogether after back vowels. In order to illustrate this, we need to compare the occurrence of some words in some European languages. Let's take the example of French, Spanish, and English. In English, the opposite of true is false. False in English is falso in Spanish. But in French, it's not for, it's, it's faux. The L has disappeared. We have words like amond, which is all mend, it surfaces with an all sound in English, and in Spanish it's almendras. Almendras. We have the word maldito in Spanish, and the corresponding word in, in French is modi. The same thing goes for plurals of some words in the masculine, nouns or adjectives. Cheval, chevaux. The L has disappeared. National, nationaux. Ordinal, ordino. Cardinal, cardinal. And so on and so forth. You also have the word scaffold in English, which surfaces in French as échafaudar. This is just an additional piece of information to illustrate how sounds can undergo some, you know, uh, undergo changes both synchronically and also diachronically. In French, the process is evidently a diachronic process. And now let's move on to a distinction that is often made between two types of assimilation. Let's talk about the difference between partial assimilation and total assimilation. Partial assimilation is self-explanatory in that the sounds that are the target of assimilation take on one or two or more features, but not all of them. This is partial assimilation. Partial assimilation can be assimilation of voice, assimilation of place, assimilation of manner. Let's talk, let's give an example of assimilation of voice, for example. When we refer to the pronunciation of the ED in, in, in English, the simple past morpheme in English, we have work and then worked. But we have receive, received. Receive its voice, that's why the ED is pronounced as D. Okay, uh, book. A hotel, for example, it's booked, not booked. Again, the D here is devoiced by virtue of its occurring immediately after a voiceless segment. Please, you know, for those of you who think that there is an E, the E there is only orthographic. So when we pronounce this, we don't say work it or work it or something, so it's worked. So there is adjacency in pronunciation of this word, of course. This is an issue that involves another case that we will not talk about here. Probably we will refer to that in one of the next videos, namely what happens when you have a sibilant s, z, etc. Or we have in, in the plural or in the end, in the ed. So what happens when we have a, a, a coronal sound like t and t. So this is just to be put between brackets. So this is a good illustration of, you know, partial assimilation. Why do we call it partial? Because the, what, what is involved is just one feature. In this case, in this case that I have mentioned, it's just voicing. Now let's take another example. Uh, we know that uh, there are certain adjectives in English, like uh, you know uh, that you know uh, that become opposites when the when you add en at the beginning. That's a prefix for you know uh, to derive the antonym of a given adjective, for example. So let's take. The word adequate. Adequate, we have inadequate. That's crystal clear. Now, why is it that when we have a word like possible, it's not impossible, it's impossible? The explanation is obvious here. It's because possible starts with a p, which is a voiceless bilabial stop. And the pre preceding nasal is initially in. Okay, so this n here, in anticipation of the production of the bilabial sound, it also assumes labiality, it also becomes labial. So p has given labiality 
or the labial feature or the bilabial feature to the preceding nasal. So that instead of saying in possible, which is heavy by the way, uh, remember that the motivation for phonological processes is to make articulation easy. So it's easier to say impossible than impossible. Think of a third example in this regard. Now we, we have a word that starts with k like credible. The opposite of credible is not incredible like inadequate. It's not incredible like impossible, but it is incredible. It's the n sound. Of course, this is again obvious since um, uh, the k of credible is a voiceless velar stop. So we have the place of articulation here is velar. The nasal also takes this velarity. So that n becomes n. It's the same place of articulation as k. So this is a case of partial assimilation. Now, for total assimilation, that's the second okay, uh, type. All right. Uh, total assimilation is the opposite of partial assimilation. It's a situation where a phonological process, a given assimilation process, takes not just some features like voice, like like place, like manner. No, no. Here it's the whole sound that is swallowed. It's the whole sound that is, you know, uh, that 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 becomes part of the preceding, you know, consonant or the following. It depends on the directionality of the assimilation process. Uh, one of the famous examples that are cited in the literature in illustration of total assimilation is Arabic. You choose classical, so standard Arabic, or even Moroccan Arabic. We have the same. Let's take Moroccan Arabic. If we have a word like kitab, the definite article is l, so we have liktab. All right? Uh, but if we have a word like tilfaza, okay? Uh, Shims, or shimsh, uh, the sun, one. So it's a tilfaza, it's shimsh. But not a tilfaza or a shimsh, like liktab, like lbab, etc. Now, why? Why is it the case? Why do we have bab, lbab, and we have kitab, liktab, but we have shimsh, shimsh, but we also have tilfaza, tilfaza. The explanation here is that we are face to face with a, a, a case of total assimilation. There is a rule governing Arabic, you know, uh, standard Arabic also, and also Moroccan Arabic. The, the rules are the same in this regard. Um, well, the l as a nat as a lateral liquid is produced by the blade of the tongue. Of course, one side has to block the air, that's why we call it lateral, and the other side allows the airflow outwards. So this is the lateral liquid. But what is interesting about le is that it shares the region or the place of articulation with sh and s and t. This is a family of sounds that we refer to as coronal sounds coronal or coronal because it, there is the blade of the tongue that is involved. Coronal, it's like a crown, coronal. And by the way, coronavirus is derived from this, you know, because its shape is again coronal. Parenthesis closed. Uh, so uh, the l sound in a shams, the l sound is a coronal sound and sh is also a coronal sound. So what happens is that the l gets swallowed by sh so that we have a geminate sh, what looks like a geminate sh. Geminate means tab'if, when we double the consonant as shams. But k is not produced with the blade of the tongue. So liktab, it's not k'tab, for example. Jmel, jmel. Again, j is a coronal sound and l is a coronal sound, so l gets swallowed. So all of the features of l get, you know, uh, become part of the preceding, you know, consonant, which is sh. That's why it doubles, because this is a process we refer to as, in fact, this is an outcome. It's a germination process. So we have so far illustrated two types of assimilation, partial assimilation, where the assimilation process takes just one or two or three features, but not all of the sound. Uh, but we have also, and, and we have talked about, Total assimilation where the whole sound changes.
as is the case with the Arabic definite article. A second distinction that is known in assimilation is between contiguous and non-contiguous assimilation. Let's talk about contiguous assimilation first. The word contiguous also means coterminous. That is to say, X is contiguous with Y means X occurs exactly near Y. There is nothing that intervenes in between. For example, we say that the two countries are contiguous, means that there is no other country between them. I have a tract of land that is contiguous with a tract of land possessed by or owned by, uh, I don't know, by a businessman, let's say. All right, so uh, here contiguous assimilation, uh, now I guess you, you, you know the, the definition, it's when the sound that initiates the assimilation and the sound that receives it are adjacent, they are neighbors. There is no vowel or consonant that comes in between. A good example, there are so many by the way, but let me take this example from French. In French, we know that there is a R sound like raté, rationnel, uh, prendre, etc. Uh, vendre, uh, ventre. <laughs> okay, so we, the, these are R sounds. But in French, generally, when this R sound occurs immediately after, notice please, immediately after a voiceless consonant, the R is not pronounced as a, it's de-voiced, it's like voiceless, which is kh. You have raté, just compare it, you know, just pronounce these things, in, these words in a fast way, and you will notice that there is a difference in pronunciation. Raté, it's voiced. The r of raté is voiced. But the r of prendre, it's not prendre, it's prendre, it's like a kh sound. Pré, la pratique, très bien. Transport. <laughs> okay? So after voiceless stops, the R sound in French becomes voiceless. This is, of course, a case of assimilation. The R sound has taken the, D, the voiceless, has taken voicelessness from its preceding consonant and uh, it becomes a R sound. And because there is nothing that interferes between P and R, as we say in Arabic, they are contiguous, we talk about here about contiguous assimilation. By the way, contiguous assimilation is also known as contact assimilation. This is the opposite of another type of assimilation, which is uh, non-contiguous assimilation or distant assimilation. These are synonyms. Distant assimilation, non-contiguous assimilation, these are you know, uh, two ways of saying the same thing. Um, as you can predict, as you may already have predicted, non-contiguous assimilation is an assimilatory process where the initiator of assimilation and its receiver are not next to each other. They are not contiguous, they are distant. That is to say, there, is, there are some phonological elements that come in between, one or two or three, it depends. A famous example to cite in this regard are some of the Moroccan Arabic words that derive from standard Arabic. Shamsun in Arabic is a shamsh, shamsh, sh, and then you have m, and then you have s. So the, the s has taken the palatal feature, palatality from this first sh. All right? Shamsh, s being an alveolar consonant. So we have words like shamsh, zujaj, Zaj, zaj, zuj, which comes from zuj, from Arabic, perhaps, which is zuj, okay, zuj. Our Tunisian friends <laughs> have reversed the process and they produce zuz, okay. Uh, so, uh, this is an example of uh, distant assimilation or non contiguous assimilation. I hope this video has shed some light on. Uh, assimilatory processes. Thank you very much and let's meet on another occasion.